I crew a lot when I went to shift, this whole thing, including How all many people were struggling trying to figure out which paralytic to give? <laughs> Everybody won with rock? No, I nice struggle. Right? How about the side one uh, going? I'm going to say potassium with my ketamine symbol there. <laughs> uh, with the ketamine versus Dominate. No. No. So you guys are getting to the point where you guys are kind of starting to get this stuff down, but now it's those extra protocols now that we're starting to throw at you where you're throwing the multifaceted protocols together and you're having to start mixing these together. So Allie, I like what you said at the very beginning, right? What did you say when I said, which first drug? What did you say? Uh, I said sodium bicarb before removal. Well, you said albuterol out loud. Oh, yeah. Right? So why, why does that make sense to go first? Because it's the cool. easiest one to get set up. Yeah, oh, super easy, super quick to get set up and get going, right? So you started the process, all right? So think about that as you start to do some of these things, as you start to set something up, you're like, oh, I know this one needs a three minute buffer, right? So you're like, ooh, I gotta get that IV, I gotta get that lidocaine started, right? So then you start, you start mixing these kind of together, mixing your protocols together in an attempt to speed up. Instead of running all the way through one pro protocol, you done be like, ooh, okay, cool. Let's move over to that crush injury protocol, right? So say you get to here, and all of a sudden, boom, they're like, hey, the person's coming out. Oh, you got to so, get that bicarb in. Right? You got to get that bicarb going, right? Oh, but then you got the albuterol that's there that you could have had going earlier as well. And then you start to kind of get this kind of inner uh, meshing of your medications and stuff so that your speed improves. Instead of boom, 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 check. Okay, now I'm going to run through this one over here. Right? So you got to start thinking big picture on patients now instead of just one protocol at a time. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. You guys got any questions? What would you put? What would you throw TXA then? The very. Uh, it'd be the, one of the last things. Oh, well, it yeah. says in our so protocol to do, like do it after extrication, or you, like your. Would you want it on board last. before? It'd be, it'd be the last thing. I'd get my airway established, get all that taken care of, make sure my bike car is ready to go, make sure everything's set there, so that when the time, it may be that hey, we're waiting on them to be removed because Tower 2 sucks, right? Uh, it must be V-shift. But uh, waiting on, on them to get them out, so it's like, oh, we can't give the bike car. So let's, we got this ready though. It's all drawn up, set, ready to go, pre-filled, ready to go. Okay, we can start skipping down, start moving down into some of these other things and start getting those boxes checked off. And TXA says give it before your first fluid, like do it before your a liter of fluid gen. So, to think okay. about so it's gonna be a race. It's gonna be a race yeah. here because what are we doing with these patients? Giving, giving them a ton of fluids, fluids like two liters. Yeah. Well, titrating to blood pressure. Eventually, we'll have to get a blood pressure. Eventually, you're going to need one, right? I'm going to say, you have an idea, yeah. you don't have an absolute, right? Uh, so, say you get to the point where you can't get access, you can't get that blood pressure, how are you going to figure it out? Pulses. Pulses. Right? Start searching multiple different parts of the body for those pulses, right? Is lower, lower torso going to work on Andrew? No. So even if you have, find a, a pulse, you're really not going to know how accurate it is because you have that tamponade stuff going on, right? Um, so I was thinking about uh, who, me? What? No, that's okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dustin. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, Dustin, you're up. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm better than Henry. Um, yeah, we, this is not a competition. There's no competition here. Always. Um, so that I was curious on when you put tourniquets on uh, patients like this, if you would, if, even though the crush up here, uh, would you put tourniquets on the legs below to eliminate the amount of junk that's coming up Absolutely. to the legs? Yeah. So so basically, what, uh, we were talking about this on the scenario we had below. So so say you're stuck at the pelvis, right? Mm -hmm. As soon as you get to that point where you have access, or say you have something down below, you're gonna throw those tourniquets on as far down as you can, just to help. Uh, avoid all of that extra uh, fluid shifting up into there. Right? So it doesn't mean that just the legs are crushed, you go well, above them. You may have to uh, delay a little bit, like, hey, okay, and they're coming out, pull them out just a little bit, throw those tourniquets on really fast, be a coordinated uh, attack with two people, be like, you got this leg, I got this leg, as soon as that's free enough, boom, on goes the tourniquet. Uh, and then, of course, what's going to happen is as soon as you guys are trying to get those tourniquets on, I'm like, and it's starting to collapse again. You have five, four, <laughs> yep. three, two, right? Um, I think I did that to one of the groups. I don't remember which group it was, but um, yeah. So it gets to that point where it's like, like you have to be coordinated with your team in order to uh, get that kind of stuff done in a timely fashion. Right? 
Sorry, Chandler. No, 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 you're good. All right. You're Chandler, what you got? No, no, I'm dealing with Justice Sparta. He asked my same questions. <laughs> oh. Sweet. Sweet. Terrible minds think alike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many of you feel ready for internship? James. Atta boy. There you go. James ready to do it. I'm excited. Nobody else? I'm excited for it. I can't wait. I'm excited for it ready. too. I'm excited to maybe see some people on calls. And be like, oh. Okay. All right, that's where we're at. All right. You're like, oh, I'm glad I wasn't your instructor. I don't, oh, wait. Oh, wait. I don't know that we would have taught you guys better. <laughs> My bad. My bad. Uh, I'm excited for you guys to get out there. I think the first uh, first couple of shifts are going to be eye opening for uh, you guys. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Does anybody have any uh, concerns or anything that they uh, have questions about before they start internship? Do we have to wear shoes? Yes, you have to wear shoes. <laughs> what am I doing around all of you? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, how about Thursday? Does that work for you? Yeah. Anybody want to write on Thursday? We have uh, a class. That's not my fault. Oh. You can come right on Thursday. Anybody can come right on Thursday. I'm going to oh. be there all day. Oh, all right. It's here Monday. Sorry, I guess that's not going to work out. How about Don't next Wednesday? Oh, we have Don't even entertain him right now. Well, I mean, I, got, I already got a rider that beat you guys to the punch uh, for the weekend ride. Um, let's see. Here, let me just give you guys days that are available. For anybody that wants to. Tuesdays don't work for me. Okay. All right, uh, let's see. Oh, we're doing Okay, we got uh, Thursday, the 11th. Wednesday, the 17th. Oh, the 23rd. Flowers, too. 26th. Oh, there we go. I was already cut off. 26th. That's the next day that I work that you guys aren't in school. Uh, and then. 26th of April? Wait, I actually have to. Then we're moving into May. Then you guys are pretty much done. I don't want to write a few yards. That's good. That's good. Um, oh, no, that's a Thursday. No, that's a Wednesday. Oh, uh, May 5th. Oh, there's a, there's a day. I'll take oh, that one. Let's see what the mile. That'll be a fun day. I'll take that one. I feel like we are the abused patient here. Uh, you're the abused patient? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> as I was, uh, as I was getting this class ready, uh, I was asking my probie, I was just like, hey, how long do you have to report uh, a child abuse? He's like, uh, and he instant looks at me like, uh, is there something that you need to report? I'm like, yeah, there is, and I need your information. He's like, uh, well, I'd have to look it up, sir. I'm like, well, isn't that an important thing to know? Like, he's like, well, uh, I'm like, because I really need to know. Like, I, I have something very important to report. And so then he instantly becomes nervous and be like, uh, okay, uh, I'll go look it up. I'm like, that's all right. I'm just kidding, man. I'm just getting ready for the students tomorrow. I go, he, I go, but you see the importance of needing to know how much time you have to make these reports, right? All right, so uh, today we're going to talk about uh, abused, elder abuse, child abuse, stuff like that. Um, some of the stuff is kind of sensitive. Uh, there's some sensitive pictures uh, that are in here. Uh, feel free, if you guys need to, to step out during it. Uh, it's totally fine. Uh, I won't judge, I promise. Of all the times I won't judge, today is one of those that I will not judge you. The one time um, uh, So if you feel like leaving right now, that's totally okay. Uh, and so we're going to talk about elder abuse, child abuse, uh, some battery assault, uh, sexual assault stuff, and kind of how to approach some of these patients um, from, our, from our profession, okay? These are some of the most hard and awkward calls to go on um, because it's not the really easy, oh, you've got chest pain, I can fix that approach, right? Like we have medications to fix that kind of stuff. A lot of these are uh, psychological and uh, as well as physical injuries to these people, okay? All right, so a couple quick uh, definitions. You've got abuse, assault, battery, and neglect. Uh, so one of the big ones here, if you take a look at battery, the unlawful attack upon another person by beating or wounding or by touching in an offensive manner. So when you go up and 
so let's back up a sec. So what's considered offensive manner? <laughs> oh, God, why, why do you have such a Right? <laughs> so is it that it was intended to be offensive, or is it the way that he receives it? So when I approach a patient, almost every single time before I touch them, I always ask them, hey, is it okay if I check your pulse? Is it okay if I do this? Because that's kind of giving the consent to be like, okay, yes. Because if I just walk up to somebody and grab their wrist, right, is that touching them that they could uh, spin that into a way where they could say it's an offensive manner? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a far-fetched thing. Do we get complaints like that kind of stuff a lot? No. Does it happen though? Absolutely. So it's all about how it's interpreted by the person that's receiving uh, the um, touch, okay? Neglect, mm, basically failing to take care of, failing to care for stuff. Uh, what are some examples of some neglect type of cases? No. No. You have quadriplegics, the usual caretakers will need to be removed uh, every couple hours or so, and hold on different different sides, they don't get sores. Okay, what else? Not feeding somebody if you're there. That's your job. Not feeding somebody? Leaving a baby unattended in a crib or in a room, locked in a room. With a wet diaper that's just screaming bloody murder for hours on end? Uh-huh. You got that living caretaker and then you respond and you find out they've got four or five days worth of excrement in their diaper. Four of what? Four or five days of excrement in their diaper. Oh, excrement. I said extra something on the diaper. Like, extra mints. Extra mints on the diaper. Extra mints in the diaper. Only one day of mints in the diaper. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Do you hear that? No. Holding meds. Yeah. meds is withholding meds. Yeah. Is withholding meds yeah. is considered neglect. Yes. Yeah. Has a doctor made the determination that they need these medications? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And is now this person who's ever in charge of distributing meds or keeping the meds or stealing the meds from them now preventing that from happening? for that person, yes. absolutely. So that would be an absolute case of neglect, okay? Uh, okay, so the assault, an attempt or offer to do violence to another without the battery. So what would that be? I'm gonna kick your ass. I, oh man, a bunch of trash talking, right? So we can't talk trash anymore in here, right? No. I'm sorry, uh -oh. sorry for everything I ever did to you, Mark. I feel like I was assaulted right there. Right, right there, just my look. No, right. just you're sorry for it. <sighs> All right, and then abuse to treat in a harmful, injurious, or offensive way, right? So we actually perform the tasks of physical contact, uh, hurting someone, causing injury. Uh, so with abuse, is that physical only? Are there only outward signs of that? Are there additional abuses? Emotional Verbal abuse, abuse, emotional abuse. Okay. So a child and elderly, right? So a child, by definition, for abuse. So you know we have the whole 15 age for consent and stuff, but anyone under the age of 18, obviously there's little loopholes and stuff like that, but as a general rule, under the age of 18 is considered a child. Anyone over 65 is considered an elder, right? So you have a DHS phone number and senior and civil services. These are the numbers uh, that you will have to contact so DHS for children and senior disabled services for elderly uh, when you're making your report. And we'll cover kind of what, what's entailed in, in that report a little bit later, okay? The mandatory reporters. Are you guys right now a mandatory reporter? Yes. yes. Why? Because we have to report on and off duty. Why? It says in the state of statute. Because you're an EMT, right? So if you have no medical training, and let's, uh, let's see, let's grab somebody from the southeast corner building over there. Are they mandatory reporters? Well, if they're an EMT. If they're, they're not, not EMTs. They're okay. not EMTs or medical. I was, was going to say somebody like down the hall, but half of these people are nurses or something like that, right? So any sort of medical training, anything like that. Teachers. Uh, automatic, yeah, teachers. It, uh, there's all kinds of different... Uh, people that are mandatory reporters, but the average person is not a mandatory reporter. We're, we are required by law to report, right? Even on duty, off duty, anything, all right? Suspicion, is this a tough one? Is it easy to, to see 
whether or not somebody's abused? Every time no. is it easy? No. Is it hard? Uh, when there's no outward signs? Or when there's stories that seem to make sense? And you're like, ooh, this could be this, or ooh, this could be that, right? Uh, we've gotten called multiple times uh, for patient checks, where there's a, a pediatric patient there, that they're like, hey, yep, I think there's abuse going on, so what do they do? They call 911, we come out, we do a medical eval on them. Awesome, right? These are super fun to do, because basically DHS is there, PD is there, and they're like, hey, we need you to do a quick medical eval on this person. You look, and they're like, yeah, the kid, uh, a toddler age, has bruises from here down the front of their legs. What does that tell you? I have a very active set of children. Exactly. So these are the cases where it's like, they're going to ask you, hey, do these injury patterns present as if this child is being abused? And you're like, huh, that's not really our, our place to say, right? Like, are we professional experts that says whether or not injury patterns are associated with those kinds of things? Absolutely not. But what we can say is exactly that. These are consistent injury patterns with a kid that could potentially be walking, a toddler, something like that, that strikes their legs on a regular basis. Can we say 100% no, that there's no abuse going on here? Absolutely not. But more than likely, in our mind, we're thinking, hmm, these injury patterns, these seem to make sense for a toddler, right? How about, um, let's see, uh, we'll go a little bit more. All right, uh, so you have a patient that you suspect child abuse, okay? And you're transporting the patient to the hospital. You get to the hospital. What do you do? Besides eat. Yeah. It's so hard. Right? I know. It's like real life, like where you just can't eat all the time, huh? After doing my report, the nurse will hand her off in a room. I'm going to go find the charge from nurse desk and I'm going to start talking to them. Okay, what are you going to say to the nurse that's receiving your patient? I'm going to say, look, I was on the, on the scene. These are the things I saw. I'm suspecting abuse, but and then I'm going to have to be very objective about what exactly I saw and not make any sort of judgments about what I saw. I need to just say, hey, look, I got there. There was a lot of dishes in the sink. Um, uh -huh. smelled, the house smelled like it hasn't been cleaned in a long time or aerated. Um, child, you know, has some some uh, markings on that we can't. We can't identify the source and or how they were done. They okay, so, so so you got to get quicker at, at that kind of presentation because as the person listening to that, I'm like, okay, I, I caught about two of, two of the lines there. Like you got to have emphasis on, hey, I think this kid's being abused, and these are the reasons why. I got this, this, and this. And you're like, oh, whoa, okay, and be like, hey, take a look at this. Look at the leg here. Check, take a look at this. This is we, this is the explanation that was given for this injury. Does that make sense to you? Because to me, it's not making sense. But I'm going to say, does this make sense to you, this injury pattern with this uh, explanation? Different stages of bruising. Right? Collared. How do you know about reporting that if the parent is transporting, or transported with the, the kid, or they're in the room with the kid while you're doing Yeah, so then you just, you just, so that's a cool thing. Like, so, hey, no, come here for a second. Don't forget your muffin. Can we hide this? then what does the nurse do when they go back in to take care of the person? They're going to do an assessment. They're going to do an assessment, and what are they checking for? So exactly what, just what I just told them to look for, right? So then they're going to be like, hmm. And what are they going to do? They're going to ask mom or dad about what the situation was, because they're going to see if there's a different story that comes along, uh, or if it's the same story they're giving me. 
And then what they start to look for is they start to look for these loopholes. They told me this, but now they're telling the nurse this. Now you don't have stories that are matching up. So why does this become very, very important in your documentation? Because that's, that's where it's going to come back. That's where, it's, that's where all of your information, uh, when they take this to court, when they take this to the police report, when they pull that information, it's coming out of your report. Right? It's not coming from what you said. Because a verbal report and a written report are two completely different things. A verbal report is basically, hey, heads up, I'm going to be sending you a report. This person can't go home because there's a significant issue going on here. Okay, so here's the written report that you get done as quick as possible, as thorough as possible, so that they have that information to be able to say, hey, we're gonna delay some tests in the ER, we're gonna slow stuff down to make sure that we get all the paperwork in line, make sure we get everybody on board, the police, whoever needs the DHS, whoever needs to be done. Um, is this an easy thing to do? No. Saki. This is really, really bad, right? Uh, I mean, not really, really bad. It's really, really hard to do because do you want to be wrong? You don't want to be right either. No? No, not at all. Yeah. So, like, this is one of the funny things that I always tell my kids. I'm just like, I'll just walk up to them and I'm like, hey, do mom or dad ever hit you? And they look at me like, no. I'm just like, do we ever spank you? No. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm like, what would you do if somebody asked you that? They'd be like, no, you guys don't. I was like, okay, so what happens when you get in trouble? Well, we get a lot of timeouts. We get our stuff taken away. I'm like, cool, right? So there's never ever, you guys are never harmed ever, right? They're like, no. I'm like, phew, all right, pass out. Because those are the kinds of questions that DHS will walk in and, and start asking, right? They're gonna ask, you like, oh, hey, what happens when you get in trouble? What happens on this? I mean, I'm not like preparing my kids for those questions, but it's like, I always wondered, I'm just like, hey, I wonder, I wonder what kind of stuff they're gonna say like as I start going through, the, through these things, I was like, huh, I wonder, wonder what in their mind constitutes them being in trouble and what, what their punishment is and stuff. It's like, oh yeah, we got this stool. Mm, you do not want the stool. It's, you sit in the corner and it's not very fun. It's like, is it a little belittling? Absolutely. But it gets the point across. It's that kind of thing, right? Uh, so it's that kind of stool. questions that you will get when, you, uh, when those DHS people will walk in and start asking questions. So now you're... Throwing, throwing this grenade in there, being like, hey, you're gonna really jack with this family, right? If things are, everything's on the up and up, it takes an emotional toll on everybody involved, right? Uh, and so, in the long run, is it the best thing for the person, the patient? Absolutely. Right. Uh, and so, we'll go over some of the uh, liability stuff uh, in regards to making reports. All right, so firefighters, nurses, EMTs, we're required by law to report the child abuse and or elder abuse based on those ORSs. Make sure you get those memorized. Cool. Uh, you have a duty to report. What is a duty to act? A duty to report. What does that mean? Legally accountable if you don't. Legally accountable. Oh, what is legally accountable? What does that mean? There's if you don't do it, you will be in trouble. Good. Good. Get the bench in the corner. You, you, yeah, you kid the bench that's still in the corner. Uh, let's see. So, person who is required to report abuse and fails to do so commits a class A violation. Is that a misdemeanor? Is that a felony? Any ideas? It's class A. Class A, what's class A? Yeah. Anybody know legal, legal mumbo jumbo? What is A? A when I was putting this together, I could totally space. I was going to look up what the class A violation was. I was just hoping somebody had some sort of. I'm, I'm pretty sure class A is the worst. I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the worst. What's felony? I, think so. I, I was guessing that, but I didn't want to say it out loud uh, because you guys do a really good job calling me on anything that I'm working on. So. Okay, good faith. Anyone participating in good faith? So this is what happens. So you suspect, right? But you're wrong, right? So you're incorrect. You pull the trigger, you say, call DHS, you file your report, but you're wrong, right? The cool thing, I mean, not really cool thing, the good thing about doing that is, is basically it frees you from liability, it frees you from any uh, further uh, prosecution in regards to um, filling out uh, or getting in trouble for any of that uh, stuff. So basically it's like a good SAM law. It's a good SAM law. Uh, so like when you guys respond on stuff, 
You do any, what any normal person would do, right? Any normal EMT. Whether, or uh, the average person, right? Um, all right, so you get, get, get a little bit of immunity. All right, so types of child abuse, okay? Physical, emotional, sexual, and neglect. So physical, it's pretty straightforward, right? Yeah? Emotional, is that easy to find? To take a little more investigation? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, how hard is it? Um, this is the first time you've ever met, met this child. How hard is it to be able to determine whether or not this child has any sort of emotional abuse? You can tell how they respond to. Does, uh, let's see. Does my oldest daughter and my youngest daughter, do they, be, did they behave the same at the same no, age? No, they do not. So it makes it very hard to judge someone based on their behavior that you see them for five minutes, right? Uh, so you start trying to look at some of their um, behavioral um, tendencies within those five minutes, if they're withdrawn. Like, uh, if Noah walked into a room with a child and the child was instantly terrified of, of Noah, that would be normal. Um, would we think that was normal? Probably, but um, <laughs> because because what do we do? What do we do when we show up? We're scary. I mean, we're, we're we're scary, and what are we carrying? We're carrying all kinds of equipment, and hey, here we come, and there's a whole bunch of us, right? Are we in light, uh, flowery colors, bright and stuff, or what, what colors are we wearing? Dark. Dark blue colors. Sometimes we have turnouts on, so like we just look very intimidating and scary to little kids, right? So I would expect a kid to be withdrawn from us as we walk in. So let's say uh, Amanda is the patient, because she's way back there, okay? Yes, what do you got? You got, you got the argument to say? What's the mission? Yeah? It's a violation. The class A? Class A is the worst. So, so the class A violation is the worst of the violations, but in terms of the way the legal system is, you have infra uh, infractions, violations, and then you have misdemeanors, and then you have felony misdemeanors, and then you have felony. So there's an A in each one of those. There's an A, B, C, almost a D in each one of them. So a violation is depending on how egregious. I think it's like a four hundred forty dollar fine. Is what I saw. Oof. All right. So maybe not a felony. Yeah. So see that that's what. Oh, that's not that bad. I guess I can get around to doing it. Is that what Noah just said? Leave it up to Noah. Sleep at night, Noah. Yep. Leave it up to Noah. All right. So let's get back to Amanda. Amanda's a little child in the back, right? Uh, because, like, as you, so say it's in a classroom or something like that, teacher calls you because there's suspicion of some sort of abuse, right? So how would you approach Amanda? What's your thought process on, every couple dollar gear, not so Probably big not and hat. scary. Do we need, do we need seven people going to assess a kid? No. no. So Amanda's sitting there, not... Not, oh, or standing there. <laughs> now I can't even see you because now you're really small. Um, so, so as my assessment, am I doing an assessment right now on Amanda? Yes. Yeah. So based on her current pre presentation right this second, okay, do I see that she's respiratory distress? Do I see any outward signs of trauma? Do I see anything that's leading me to be like, hey, red flag, red flag? No, not so. So do I need everybody else to run up there and do blood pressures and vital signs and stuff like that? No. Absolutely not. But what do we do in our free hospital setting? We run up there. Yeah. Everybody there. runs up there, right? So not the best thing. So like a lot of times, so my approach for something like that, we're like, hey, why don't you guys go talk to the teachers, figure out what's going on, right? I'll pull up the chair right there by Amanda and be like, hey, what's going on? How are you? What's your name, right? Uh, ask her how old she is. Gain, try and gain a little trust, right? It's like, oh, hey, you're eight years old. Oh, I got a, I got a daughter that's eight year old too. It's like awesome, right? It's like, oh, ooh, right? So that's a cool thing about having kids is like, no matter what, like you have some sort of, it's like, oh man, I remember when my daughter was your age. Oh, it's so awesome. Now she's just grown up and she's not very nice to me. And you know, all those kinds of things, right? Uh, so it's that kind of approach. Like you try and gain that trust. Do I go right into it? It's like, oh, where are you hurting? What's going on? Like, do you have chest pain, shortness of breath? Uh, how long has this been going on? Okay, does anything make it worse? Uh, so we're going through our own QRST, right, Blake? Here you go. Boom, there's your 10 questions. Go. Right? So do my questions can significantly change yes. instantly with the pediatric? Absolutely, right? So you have to have a different, completely different approach um, for approaching kids like that. 
Uh, so then we have uh, sexual abuse and we have the neglect. Sexual abuse is going to be uh, pretty hard to, uh, most of the time these are not pre-hospital uh, 911 calls that we get called for a lot of times. Uh, it's very, very rare that we'll get uh, emergency calls for these kinds of things. And if so, it's basically the, the PD is there because they were there on suspicion of it. And then when a medical eval, so basically you're transporting just straight down uh, to the hospital. You're not doing a whole lot of assessment or anything like that. Uh, the neglect will go on neglect stuff, where they'll go on welfare checks, DHS will be there. And they'll be like, hey, boom, you roll in, you're basically there for a patient eval, and the kid's laying in bed, barely get out of bed. Weak, dehydrated, malnourished. It's like, oh, okay. Um, I don't know if you guys saw uh, a while back, uh, somebody was, uh, uh, never mind, never mind. I'm not even going to go there. Because uh, there may be people connected to it, so forget it. Moving on. Ah, okay, uh, hopelessly crying. So at some point, other than uh, like infants and newborns that just cry and cry and cry when they're keening or what about uh, colicky, uh, do most kids just cry inconsolably? Usually there's something. Usually they'll get tired. Usually they'll they'll slowly start to slow down or. Or you can distract them instantly and they go from full tilt one way and be like, oh, teddy bear, hey, right? So anytime you have a kid that you just can't console, there's usually something else going on. Either they're in pain, uh, they're scared, there's something there that you want to try and figure out uh, what's going on with that kid. Uh, so avoiding their parents. So if you show up and they run to you away from mom and dad, is that a big concern? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because mom and dad should technically be their safety blanket. That's a bad thing, right? Right. So like mom and dad should be the safety net latched onto the leg, and you're like, come on, like hey, go see, like, right? Um, and so like yeah, when people come over to my house, like, like if it's somebody I don't know or it's a, it's a friend of mine or something like that, my kids don't know. It's like I go to the room, like hey, where are my kids at? They're behind me. There's no way they're going out to see who's who's here. Until I do, they're like, oh, hey, this is so-and-so. It's like, they're cool, yeah, you're good. And, you know? Uh, Mark shows up and is like, nope, run. Run now. <laughs> <laughs> Save your show. <laughs> uh, uh, and then uh, fearful of physical contact. So say we finally get to that point with Amanda where we're like, hey, is it okay if we check your blood pressure? Is it okay if we check your pulse and stuff like that? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But as soon as you make contact, if there's flinching or anything like that, you instantly are just like, you know what? I don't even care about the blood pressure, right? Because what, is, what just happened with the anxiety level and the thought process going on with Amanda's head there? Right. Something, something, you just brought something uh, back to the forefront, okay? So alert, always alert for danger. What is that? What kind of approach is that? So if Amanda's back there, and we start to come back to see her, what is she going to try and do? <laughs> yeah, so if I come around this way, what she's more than likely going to start to scooch her way around the table that way. So what am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to run back this way, and I'm going to chase them, right? Back up. No, no, it's like instantly I'm just like, ooh, something's up, right? I'm going to do all my questioning from way back, because she's scared, and I need to figure out why, OK? You hungry, Noah? No. I'm always I'm starving. I can almost hear your stomach growling from there. Uh, all right, prone to behavioral changes. What types of behavioral changes? Angry. Oh, so they can go from zero to 60 just like that, right? You have no idea what sets them off, and instantly they'll just, something will set them off. Uh, to the point where they can be destructive, they can destroy things, they can hit, they can kick. Normally nonviolent children can become violent. Um, and then within 10 seconds after the incident, boom, they're right back to where they were. Uh, so they get these very, very significant changes, but it could be something that just simply just set them off for that short period of time. Uh, and then they just have, they, do kids have a very good ability of coping and dealing with things? Mm -hmm. No, they haven't figured out those coping mechanisms yet. All right. Uh, all emotions. If you have a kid with no emotions, so what would uh, what would a kid with no emotions look like? No. Like really flat affect. No, no care that you're there. Yeah. No interaction with you. Very just stoic, monotone voice. 
not really making eye contact, really want nothing to do with you. Is that a normal thing for a kid? Not usually, right? So what do most normal kids do when they see EMTs and firefighters? Super cool. Or excited. Check everything. Most of them are super, they're either super cool or they're a little bit afraid because they, they don't really know what, what's going on, right? But as soon as you take them out and be like, oh, look at the ambulance, they're like, wow, awesome, right? Everybody loves it. Um, so most of the time, we get a very, very positive reaction from kids, right? So that's why you always carry, always carry stickers with you all the time, right? Because what do kids love? Stickers, right? Yeah, oh, hey, check out what I got. Hey, I got a badge, sticker badge. Hey, you want to be one of us? Awesome, cool, yeah. Right? So then, what does that do if I have a sticker? Hey, man, I got the sticker for you. Do you want the sticker? Oh, yeah, she does. Shiny, <laughs> want the sticker. Shiny thing. Right? So then, what does that do, though? What does that allow me to do now? It, it breaks that ice. It so I can get a little closer, right? And be like, oh, hey, you want the sticker? And I get closer and closer. And then, do I immediately drop the sticker and run away? <laughs> or did that just buy me a little 10 feet of space there? Yeah. Right? A little bit of trust. Just that much, right? Okay. Uh, all right, so here we go. Back to this, instincts of knowledge of age-related behavior. Okay, Noah, here you go. Here's a good one for you. So how does a five-year-old react when they don't get dessert? A normal five-year-old. Arms that. Crying, very upset. Come on, Noah. Get to it. Okay. So, how many people in here have kids? Oh, less than half. Oh, boy. Okay. So, when you, uh, have, okay, how about this? How many people have nieces or nephews? There we go. That's a little bit. So, get to know those nieces and nephews because that helps you interact. Like, I love watching new firefighters try and interact with pediatric patients on scene. I'll kid you not. <laughs> This is how they care for pediatric patients. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Okay, let's get you, get you on the gurney. <laughs> I'm exhausted. That was the hardest call I've read in like five years. Oh, boy. Right? Uh, versus somebody that has kids, that's been around kids. How do we care for people? It's as if it's just a, another person that we're talking to, right? We're used to the age-specific behavior. We're able to interact with these kids. Like, I love running on kid calls. Uh, granted, it's not usually, I mean, most kid calls, because most of the time we can fix the problem and they're not really that hurt. We're there because they got their head stuck in something, uh, their leg stuck, their hand stuck, right? And what do we do? We free it, and then it's just like, ah, let's go check out the fire truck, right? They don't go to the hospital, they don't do anything like that. Every once in a while, you get a super sick kid. Right? New paramedics that don't have kids have no idea how to treat these people. Because they, they just don't even want to touch the kid. They're just like, that kid's really sick. I don't even know what to do. Paramedic school, gone. They just blank out. <laughs> I don't even know what to do. I don't know my, I don't know my drugs. I don't know anything. It's just like, like, let's load and go. I'm like, yeah. That's not. That's, that's Come on, kids. No, 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 stranger. Get in my van. Get in my van. Let's just get in the van. <laughs> My van has lights and siren. It's a little different than the other vans. Right? Uh, and so there's a big difference. And so just uh, when it comes to kids, like just getting around the kids and, and interacting with kids and uh, figuring out how to facilitate. And it's like, I'll be honest, I, I, let, I let the firefighters do a little bit of their stuff, right? I'll sit there and I'll be like, okay, because it gives them the opportunity to learn and stuff like that. And I find them just like, Okay, here we go. It's like, because then, like parents, it's very easy for me to go into dad mode mm -hmm. and be like, okay, hey kiddo, what's going on, right? And I can sit down and I can have a full conversation. I take my clipboard, I hand it off to one of the other guys, be like, yeah, go do something constructive, would you? <laughs> right? Because we're of no help to you on this one. The interesting thing is, is most of the time, they'll, they'll, they'll gladly step back, right? But why, do, why is it that I allow them to do stuff to start off with? So you gotta learn somehow. You gotta learn, right? You gotta learn somehow. If I just walk in and immediately go into dad mode and take, o take over the call, they will never hit that dad mode type of thing, right? Until they're way down the road. Okay. How about a teenager? <laughs> oh, the teenager. Oh, the teenage years. Love the teenage years. They're super awesome. Teenagers are assholes. Teenage yeah. girls are the best, just gotta say. <laughs> I got two of them now. 
Yeah, nothing like two teenagers. You probably get a lot of each other. Yeah. So, um, you respond for an out of control uh, 14 year old girl. Ketamine. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I got a great ketamine story that I'll finish up this little thing with the ketamine story. I kid you not, this was perfect. The whole, the, it was one of my firefighters, he, he started off with like, so I learned something yesterday. He goes, you really want to be accurate when you're giving your ketamine dosing. <laughs> I was like, he goes, okay. so if you give too much and you were just trying to mellow somebody out a little bit, it makes them go to sleep. <laughs> I was like, oh, he's like, so I'm just going to tell you about the story now because I'm into the story now because I'm just thinking about it. Uh, so it was like, he estimated at like roughly 60 kilos for this little lady that there were three cops pinning this person down and he takes a quick look he's like, oh yeah, it's like 60 kilos. He goes over, he draws up 60 kilos worth of meds, right? Comes back, doesn't even do anything and he, and, and he gives, gives her the IM shot. Does he go to four milligrams per yes. kilo? Yes. Oh, yeah. Of course he does, because it's going IM. Why not just go like, go big? Right, exactly, right? Four. We talked about this. Four. You can't, can't, can't hold somebody. Two. You're can't holding them, right? <laughs> so, four. Yes. Gluteus maximus. <laughs> and then he takes a step back, and as things start to kind of calm down, this person starts to thrash, stops the thrash, looks down, he's like, huh? 60. Hmm, that might be more like the 40, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> and he's like, I think this person may even be a little person. <laughs> and then the cops slowly start kind of peeling off, and he's like, uh-oh. He's like, I'm pretty sure she's turning cyanotic now. He's like, oh. So they finally get her all, and they roll her over, and he's like, oh boy, I was way off. And so we went from 60 down to about four, like this person was like this big. Like, but it was a, gro a grown female person that was thrashing to the point that three cops were having a hard time. Uh, and so, yeah, they ketamined, and they would say they had to back all the way to the hospital. And then, so the pass off goes something like this, he said. He goes, he goes, yep, so there we were. We walked in, lots of people, lots of thrashing. I took a quick size up, went over, drew up some thing, and I gave the ketamine, and, and, and the, the nurse goes, how much? He's like, so I drew up some ketamine, and then I gave it, and I was like, how much did you give? And he's like, so we called her 60 kilos to start off with, and then we realized after the fact that she was closer to 40 kilos, and they're like, okay, maybe we need RT here to help like manage airway kind of thing. And he's like, yeah, this is a good learning point on my behalf. Um, I'm going to do my chart now. And he said he walked out. And then you could just hear the scrambling happening. They're just like, we need to bag this person. He's like, I told you, you need to bag. I told you, I mean, Sat's okay for a little while, and then just kind of <laughs> starts to drop because she's just so sedated. And so he was just like, oh yeah, a little person gets ketamine. Hey, why not? Uh, so he's just like, yeah, I learned to do a much better scene size up, and a much better, okay, okay, yeah, you're definitely, you're definitely 40 kilos. Let's go with 40 kilos. Uh, so. Okay, so now it's how old, how old is the patient? It was a girl, uh, like an adult. Oh. Like, uh, like a little person. Yeah, like 50, 50 year old female, but was like, he said, like, and he's a little bit taller, so he, I mean, he's probably, probably my size then. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but he went like this. He's like, yeah, she's like maybe that tall and maybe like that big. Like, he was like, she was like a small, small person. Like, that's why I said it might even have been a, a little person kind of thing. Uh, and so it's just this, he's like, yep, I was way off. I learned something. He's like, it definitely snows people when you go over the top. I'm like, oh, good. So we can talk about that with our site. We're accomplishing what we're wanting to accomplish when we do this, right? Okay, so now, boom, we're back to that 14-year-old. Uh, Mom calls because daughter's out of control. As you walk in the house, there's three EPD, or S, no, EPD, we'll go EPD. Uh, EPD <laughs> officers are standing there like this. <laughs> She's in there. And you walk in and you see, and it's a wood door that has holes in the door. Like, like, like this size, like, size like, like punching through the hole, throwing okay. stuff, crack stuff, and you're like, all right. So what is your first thought? Teenager. Safety. Did she get broken up? Somebody broke up with her. Uh, <laughs> if, only, <laughs> if only it was that easy. If only it was that easy. So, so you stop. And you're like, wait a second. What's 
What's behind? What's, what's in there? What behind number two. two. <laughs> uh, because, because, oh, another story, real quick. Because I just got told the story like five minutes, like five minutes before I got here. So when you get dispatched to a bipolar female, thirty-five-year-old female, like you're thinking. Well, wow, that's how dispatch comes over. Right. So you have oh. this thought process. What you're walking into. You have a general idea, right? So the crew walks in. They come around the corner, and there is a. Uh, Close to 300 pound uh, Samoan male <laughs> sitting on the couch that is identifying as a female that is very upset that you are down there. But you walked into it like, hey, okay, we go on psychiatric, we go on psychological issues all the time, we go on bipolar stuff. Like, hey, okay, like you just walk in expecting one thing and then all of a sudden you're just like, backtrack, backtrack. <laughs> And instantly, so there's another probie on the call, and so there's this whole confusion of uh, he versus she, like, hey, can, can I please see, sir, can I see your arm, or, or ma'am, can I see your thing? And then you got somebody else chipping, and it's like, hey, it's a female, blah, blah, blah. And so then that escalates this person, which escalates that person, which then escalates everybody on the scene, and then you're just like, let's just get out of here. We gotta go, let's just get out of here, right? Uh, so they're like, yeah, we learned a quick thing about on how to quickly calculate ketamine. You just have it in a syringe on every call you walk into. <laughs> just like, just have 400 ready to go for every single person. They're like, the pro they go, the problem is, is, I don't think 400 would have done the job. We would have been underdosing on this person. They're like, well, it would have given you a quick and run type of a approach, but. Um, okay, so whew, all right, here we are. We're back to our 14 year old with the door, right? So we want to see, we want to see, we want to see stuff. Uh, 